Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. Today, we will discuss the Mexican Mafia's relationship with boxing. Sure, there were some brothers that enjoyed pumping iron like Danny Dangerous Dan Avila from the Avenues, but most of the fellas preferred to get their exercise on the handbox court and in the ring. But before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressors shall eat violence. As mentioned earlier, most of the mafiosos of this era preferred playing handball and boxing instead of pumping iron for their exercise. This was due to their code of conduct. These men were playing for keeps. Gone were the days of fighting to settle a dispute. If they were going to make a move on an adversary, they plan on running some steel up inside of them with the intent of taking their wind. Anything less was seen as a failure or not worth talking about. Furthermore, the manner in which these men displayed their loyalty to the Big M, to one another, and gained clout within the organization was through murder. So they concentrated on exercise strategies that they felt prepared them best for this task. With this in mind, many of the fellas focused on the combination of handball and boxing. Handball helped with the hand-eye coordination, got their wind up, kept them loose and limber, and helped them with their footwork. The same was felt about the sweet science of boxing, with the added benefit of learning how to do the most damage if caught on arm through well-placed punches. Weightlifting, on the other hand, was believed to make a fighter too bulky and clumsy. Furthermore, large muscles require large amounts of oxygen, thus making a big man liable to gas out sooner. These men wanted to be fast, fluid, and deadly, which they believe handball and boxing accomplished. Now let's turn our attention to the article entitled El Anillo or The Ring. Although Folsom doesn't have a regular fight card as do most other institutions, there are still many who prefer to work out in the Oval Square to stay in condition. Such is the case with Bebito Alvarez and Robert Nego Cabral, who train hard just if they were going to defend their title soon. Bebito Alvarez, who at one time was the welterweight champ, decided to get a good workout and went and got a hold of Robert Cabral, the lightweight champ, and set a two-week ring appointment. Nego Cabral showed up with his trainer, Chente Gutierrez, and Bebito brought along Kiki Maez to assist in his corner. Richard Huero Psycho Rodriguez was the third man in the ring. He himself was a lightweight champ at one time. The bell started the first round of a six-rounder, and both fighters used it to fill out their opponent. Round two saw the pace pick up, and the bell found Chente working on a cut over Nego's right eye. As the bell sounded beginning of round three, Kiki Maez gave last-minute instructions to Bebito. Rounds three and four gave the spectators a glimpse of boxing professionalism at its best. Bebito suffered a nose cut and was bleeding from the mouth as the bell rang for round five. Both fighters put on an exhibition that many will remember for some time to come. Condition is what made this exciting fight possible. A lot of hard work and dedication are the key to any fighter's success. Our thanks to both of these dudes for putting on an excellent boxing exhibition. As mentioned in the article, longtime mafioso Huero Saco Rodriguez from Samper was a former lightweight champion. Here he is in another picture of him in Folsom, working the heavy bag with fellow carnal, Frederick Duke Gearhart from Canoga Park. Huero Saco paroled by 1977 and was living in Silmar, California. He settled down and was enjoying semi-retirement. I know the reglas say the only way out of the clica is in a coffin, but it's their rules and they broke them and bent them as they saw fit. Moreover, there were other members like Potato Nose Loera who were allowed to retire from active participation in the Mafia's business and enjoy his family. Having joined the Mariposa in the early 60s, Huero Cycle was a long-term brother with a lot of love from the fellows, so it was not surprising that he would be allowed to just kick back. But being retired, he was expected to stay out of the Mafia's business. Bueno Saco was not only a former boxing champ, he was also a hope to die the Cato. He began extorting gangs in the San Fernando Valley in the name of the Mexican Mafia to feed his habit. He was warned to cease and desist by the fellas, but he continued. As a result, he was placed on the lista and his fellow homeboy and Mafia brother, Big D Garcia, and his blood brother and Mafia brother, Ralph Vito Rodriguez, paid a visit to Huero Cycle's home in Silmar and executed him on December the 3rd, 1977 for his transgressions. This is actually the incident that inspired the killing of Little Puppet by his big brother Puppet in the movie American Me. 
Another well-known pugilist was Donald Big D. Garcia. He is well-known both in the feds and in the CDC for his skill in the ring, becoming a middleweight champion of many of the prisons he was housed in. When Big D was housed at the Dual Vocational Institution, he met Gabriel Little Slogo Castaneda from Moyomara, who was also a student of the sweet science, and the two trained together. Everyone wanted them to mix it up in the ring, but unfortunately that didn't come to pass. This photo was taken in Susanville in 1972 and contains Nego Cabral, who is featured in the thumbnail picture sparring with Bebito Alvarez. Frank Nitti, another alias Nego Cabral was known by, due to his smooth style, was also a lightweight champ. He and Doroteo Sleepy Bentoncourt from Calexco can be seen here working on the speed bag. On October the 4th, 1972, Sleepy teamed up with another student of boxing, Eddie Pelon Moreno from Norwalk, to execute Nuestra Familia soldiers Richard Bowico Medina from Sacra and Frank Diamond Miranda from Fresno in Dome 41 at Susanville. As mentioned earlier, Pelon Moreno was also a practitioner of the sweet science. Some of the fellas picked up boxing behind the walls, but others grew up on the streets boxing. Here is a very old picture of Pelon, and as you can see, he began boxing as a very young child. Another mafioso that grew up boxing was Roy Sonny B. Ballesteros from Hazard Grande. The 1950 census listed Sonny B.'s occupation as a prize fighter. He often fought on boxing cards Monday nights at the Southgate Arena in Los Angeles. Unfortunately for Sonny B., he not only grew up boxing but also getting high. This would lead to the end of his boxing career and dancing in the ring, to his career as a Mexican Mafia enforcer dancing on the concrete yards of the CDC. In 1973, Big Rob Williams from the BGF was unshackled in the visiting room and Sleepy Bentercourt had just completed his visit and was shackled in preparation to be taken back to his unit. Sleepy was escorted past Big Rob in full restraints when Big Rob took advantage of the situation and sucker punched Sleepy, temporarily knocking him unconscious. A few days later, Sonny B, who fought as a lightweight and welterweight, and now was about five foot seven and 170 pounds, engaged Big Rob in a fist fight on the AC yard. Big Rob was much larger than Sonny B at six foot one, 250 or 260 pounds. Sonny B used his boxing skills to strike Big Rob, bob and weave, preventing Big Rob from landing a punch or getting a hold of him. But Sonny B was just too small to be able to bring the big guy down. The AC gunner ended the fight by firing a couple of warning shots. This picture features two more mafiosos mixing it up in the ring at the Correctional Training Center's North Facility in 1969. On the left is Luis Million Dollar Lou Valenzuela from Primera Flats, and on the right is Lil Ducoud from Los Ochentas. Million Dollar Lou won this fight by a TKO. He was the first Mexican Mafia casualty of the 1972 war against the Nuestra Familia. On April the 4th, 1972, M. Carnales, Philip Black Segura, Raymond Chavo Perez, and Manuel Chita Padilla attacked N. Familianos, Woodsy Reyes, and Joe Death Row Joe Gonzalez due to a dispute over a punk. The Familia retaliated on April the 10th, 1972, when Frank Joker Mendoza stabbed Milan Dalalu non fatally. This picture contains Stephen Little Bunky Juarez from Sangra. If you enlarge this picture, you can see that he has Sangra tattooed across his stomach. Little Bunky was one of three brothers that were inducted into the Mariposa. The other two Juarez brothers are Victor QP Juarez and Gilbert Big Bunky Juarez. In today's era, the recruitment of multiple brothers is strictly forbidden due to all the chaos caused by the Grajero brothers. This is a picture from the early 1960s in San Quentin containing both Richard Grumpy Garcia from Primera Flats and Ernest Kilroy Royball from White Fence. Grumpy was murdered by the fellas on the streets in the Montebello home of Associate Red Overton. Grumpy was messing around with Helen Morazic, who was the Bell Bondswoman for the fellas. He was warned not to let his personal feelings get in the way of Emmett business. Apparently, he didn't listen, so he was shot to death on May the 25th. 1978, just one day prior to his 36th birthday. Gilroy was a natural athlete and he excelled at any sport he tried. For example, he was being recruited for his baseball skills prior to his incarceration. He also loved to play handball. This is a picture from the Folsom Observer containing Kilroy on the left 
Adolf Champ Reynoso in the middle, and Big D Garcia on the right. In the caption of the picture, Kilroy is labeled with the moniker of Sugar Roy. This moniker originated from his boxing days, and he was also called Sug, Sugar, or Sugar Roy. Kilroy truly loved boxing, and even when his competition days were long behind him, he still worked out and trained other fighters. Here he is in Folsom in the early 1980s, raising the hand of one of his fighters. But the one man that many believe was the most dangerous and gifted boxer of this era was Mundy. Armando Mundy Barrella was from the extinct barrio of First in Indiana. Most of Mundy's prison time was served at Folsom Prison, where his boxing skills were the talk of the prison underworld. Mundy was a natural talent and admired by everyone in the boxing realm. At 180 pounds and 6 feet in height, his punchy power was devastating in the light heavyweight class, and his footwork was amazing. In 1971, Mundy and some of the fellas were housed at Chino. There he and Frank Joker Mendoza from Redondo engaged in a handball game. And yes, this is the Nuestra Familia's Joker who participated in the murder of Cheyenne Cadena in Palm Hall on December the 17th, 1972. But before joining La Familia, Joker was a staunch supporter of the Mexican Mafia and had even asked Cheyenne to be made a member. However, Cheyenne declined, explaining to Joker that that is not how it works, and basically told him, you don't call us, we'll call you. This, however, did not mean that Joker would not have been made later down the line. He more than likely would have been inducted into the Mafia if he had not joined the Nuestra Familia. Joker soundly defeated the older Mundy in the handball game and began to tease him by telling him, You got no win for me, old man. Mundy replied, Handball's not my game, kid. This is my game, holding up a clenched fist. Being a good street fighter, Joker was game, and he accepted the challenge and the two laced up their gloves and got into the ring. Mundy told Joker that he was going to teach him how to respect his elder, and furthermore, he would handle his business with an open glove. Mundy battered Joker, slapping him relentlessly in the face and body. After just the first round, Joker was spent and had red welts all over his face and body from the beating. He tapped out and congratulated Mundy. To be clear, this is not meant to demean Joker. He was a vicious street fighter and would become one of the Nuestra Familia's deadliest enforcers. However, he was certainly outmatched by Big Mundy. In this picture, we can see Alex Mo Farrell from El Oyomara wearing boxing gloves. Little Mo was an MF fanatic and a true believer. He constantly encouraged aggressiveness and violence by the fellas and set the bar high for the other mafiosos to emulate. On November the 15th, 1985, in Folsom's three block, Mo was stabbed by his cell partner, Daniel, Daniel Boy Pina from Big Hazard and Angel Stump Valencia from Sangra, while Ruben Tupi Hernandez from Ontario held the door shut. Mo was reported to have told his assailants, I'm dying, you did your job. Leave now before you get caught. Mo was taken to University Medical Center in critical condition, slipped into a coma, and connected to a life support system. Longtime Aryan Brotherhood member Wendell Blue Norris was in the University Medical Center recovering in the same room as little Mo. It was reported that Blue had taped together two deodorant containers and inserted them into his garage to stretch out the rectum to facilitate his ability to hide contraband. Unfortunately for him, the deodorant containers became stuck, requiring surgery to remove them. On February the 13th, 1986, Mo woke from his coma and Blue said that Mo told him, If I can't be a carnal, I don't want to live. Mo then proceeded to disconnect himself from his life support system and die. Although there are many other examples of Mexican Mafia members that enjoyed boxing, the last we will discuss is Richard Richie Ruiz from Bakers. Here you can see him raising his arm after a victorious bout. His boxing skills would later save his life. In May of 1980, Richie was convicted of robbery, assault with a deadly weapon, and two firearm use charges. On June the 26th, 1980, Richie arrived at Folsom Prison. Upon his arrival, he was told by investigating officers that he was in danger because the Mexican Mafia was planning to murder him. Richie laughed and assured them that due to his lofty status in the Mafia, he would never be marked for murder. But by July the 5th, 1980, Richie had received more warnings about his safety that he asked Daniel Spider Arriaga to watch his back at the baseball game they were attending. 
Richie trusted Spider because he was Spider's padrino. Spider was one of the so-called young guns recruited by Richie in 1970 at the Duval Vocational Institution. However, Spider was a loyal MS soldado that knew no one was bigger than the Big M. Richie asked Spider to sit behind him at the baseball game. Spider agreed and then proceeded to stab Richie in the arm and chest. Richie, an ex-prison boxing champion, hit Spider with a quick combination, ending the attack. This led to Richie's defection from the Mexican Mafia. These men all had special gifts and talents, but they wasted them behind the walls shooting dope and engaging in violence. Take this into consideration before getting involved in that world. Because like I have said many times before, there is no pot of gold waiting at the end of the rainbow in that world. Only a cement box or a box six feet under. Good night and God bless.